chapter 8 this morning. We'll start to read from verse 18. Paul is writing to the church in Rome in the verses just before we pick up this morning. He is encouraging them to think about who they are in Jesus. They are heirs with Christ. They are children of God. And he picks up in verse 18 by saying this. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected him in hope. Because the creature itself, that is creation, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but a hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man saith, why doth he yet hope for? But if we do hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. With God's word open before us this morning, let's just pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the words that we have been reading. We want to declare once again that this is your word. This is nothing of us. And Lord, we just ask that by your spirit, you would take your own word and you would apply it into our hearts for our encouragement. And Lord, for our challenge, we pray, but ultimately for your glory. Amen. I wonder how many times in your life you've been caused to think, that's just too good to be true. Maybe you've seen something or you've heard something and you've thought, Do you know what, that is just too good to be true. I'm sure if you're here this morning and you are a parent, that is something that you've thought many times. As you've watched your child or your teenager and they've come bundling into the kitchen and they've gone, Mommy, Daddy, your hair looks really nice today, Mommy. Or maybe it's, Dad, is there anything you'd like me to do for you? What can I do? And you're thinking to yourself, well, there's a whole lot I'd like you to do, but what do you want? And you know, I would really love it to be true. I would love to think that my child has just come to the place where it suddenly clicked for them and they're going to help me for no reason whatsoever. But you know, chances are it's too good to be true. They don't really want to help you. Ladies, they don't really think your hair is as nice as they say. They just want something in return. And you know, sometimes we can come to passages or verses in the Bible and we can perhaps think, that's just too good to be true. Read with me again verse 28 of Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Really? Really? all things. You know, maybe you're in the middle of a circumstance in your life, or maybe there is suffering. You're going through trials. No one else knows about it. And you come, and you've heard this verse this morning, and you think, that's maybe just too good to be true. You trust that God works good things for good, but so difficult is your trial that you have to ask, will this really be worked together for good? And so often, Scripture, whenever we just read it, it sounds good. But whenever we take it 
and we hold it up against life, sometimes it just seems too good to be true. You know, this morning, God wants to do the same thing that Paul was seeking to do to the church in Rome. He wants to encourage us and give us hope that we can believe his word, that we can believe it's true. It's not too good to be true. And I just want to simply unpack this passage and give you encouragement this morning just to rest in God's promise that all things can work together for good. You know, so often aren't we anxious to know what that good is? Perhaps in your life it's a bereavement. Perhaps it's sickness. Perhaps you've been hurt by someone and you're really, really quickly, straight away, you want to know where is the good and you're questioning God and you're looking all around you, where's the good? When is the good going to come? And we're anxious, aren't we? We're anxious to see it and to know it for ourselves. But you know, before we can ever understand what the good is, it's really important that we know what it isn't, that we know what the good that God promises is not. You know, God does not promise an easy life. If you go through the Word of God, He never at any stage promises for His people an easy life. Whenever Paul says we know that all things work together for good, he's not talking about a comfortable easy life where everything's easy, you're never challenged, nothing is ever difficult. That's not what Paul is speaking about. In Luke 14, Jesus addresses this. There's a crowd before him. Everybody wants to see Jesus. They want to hear him. And Jesus says, unless you renounce everything you have, unless you bear your cross, unless you hate your own life, you cannot be my disciple. He makes it as plain as that. He promises suffering and hardship for his people. The good that Paul is talking about is not an easy life. Secondly, it's not a license to sin. The good is not a license to sin. If we are to believe that God works all things together for good, if we believe that, then we have to trust that God is sovereign. What does that mean? It means that God is Lord over absolutely everything in this universe. There is not a death in Japan There is not a sickness in Brazil or there is not a trial for one of us in Kilkeel that he does not know about, that he is not allowed to happen. That's what it means to trust that God is sovereign, to believe that he is Lord over everything, not just some things, but everything. And then the danger can be for us to think, well, that means that we can sin and get away with it. Because if God is sovereign... He works all things together for good. Does that mean that I can sin and God's going to bring it about for good? Does that mean I can get away with it? Turn back with me just a few chapters, Romans 6, verse 1. Paul addresses this very question when he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Look how strong his language is in verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin? live any longer therein. In the second half of verse 4, he says what we are to do, we also should walk in newness of life. If God is sovereign and he works all things together for good, not a comfortable easy life, not a license to sin, and thirdly and perhaps most difficultly for us, it's not our understanding of good. To know that God works all things together for good. We all think that we know best. If you've ever watched a stubborn child, I'm sure you've seen them, and they think they know best. They think that they can go in there or they can do that, and you know in your head it's going to end up in pain. It's going to end up in suffering for them. And you try to tell them, but they know best. They're stubborn. And sometimes as Christians, we're stubborn. We think we know what the good is. And often, the good to us may seem bad. It could be pain. It could be hurt. We could be humbled by God, but it's not about our understanding of good. It's about His. He is faithful. He knows us better than we know ourselves, and He will work things together to His understanding of good. It's about whether or not we are willing to have faith in His judgment. 
question then is, what is the good? We've looked at what it's not, and I'm sure we all want to know what the good is. You know, the difficult thing is sometimes we just don't know what the good is. You know, I sat, as other people here, sat at a funeral service a couple of weeks ago of a 10-year-old boy. And as I watched that coffin come in, and I was over and over and over again in my head saying, what is the good? 10-year-old boy allowed to die. God, what is the good? And I was questioning in my own head, where is the good of this? Do you know what? I still don't know. I don't understand. I don't pretend to. But I have faith. Verse 24, what does Paul say? We are saved by hope. I love this. But hope that is seen is not hope. If you know all the answers, if you understand everything, then you don't need to have faith. Then you don't need to have hope. And the things that we don't understand, that's where faith steps in. That's where hope steps in. You've probably heard the expression, let go and let God. Sometimes we just don't know and we don't understand. I wonder this morning, do we have the faith to let go and hand over to God and trust in His character, in His judgment for our lives? You know, verses 28 to 30 are a chain an unbroken chain where Paul is speaking to the Roman believers and he's given them encouragement. He's given them encouragement as to why they can believe, verse 28, why they can believe that God works all things together for good. Listen to them again as we read them, verses 28 through to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. First time I read that verse, I thought that is just too much theology at once. That is too much to process. I can't take all of these big terms, predestination, calling, justification. There's all too much going on at once. You know, this morning, if we want to have that hope, that faith to believe that all things work together for good, the first thing that Paul shows us that we need to do is look back. Sometimes we need to look back. You know, this week at Coaching for Christ, every morning there were certain jobs to do. The pitches had to be set out. The drills had to be set out. And there was one thing, and it was just going to be the bane of our lives that week, it was this gazebo. Now, Mark Palance is laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. It was this gazebo, and it had to be set up beside Willie's camper van, and it had to be set up, and the ladies, they were going to sit under there. They were going to register all the kids in there, and as well, we were going to eat our lunch there. Now, Paul Morris, is Paul Morris here? Monday morning, Paul Morris said, lads, it's four poles and a tent. It's four poles and a tent. And I thought... There's Mark Balance, there's me, and there's Matthew Campbell. So we've got the experience, we've got the good looks, and we've got the youth. <laughs> Surely the three of us can put up four poles and a tent. Ten minutes later, this four poles and a tent was no closer to being up than it had been when we started. There was, wee, there was long poles, there was short poles, there was springs that needed to go in. Why's that corner got tape on it? There's numbers, and we're, this gazebo, four poles and a tent, Paul Morris said. And we're struggling, and Willie, you know, Willie wasn't really much help. You're not getting on well there, lads, are you? No, you're, <laughs> you're, you're struggling there, lads. And Mark says, aye, Willie, aye, you know, you know. And uh, Willie was no help whatsoever, and we're sort of, we're, and we're sticking this in there. And we get it eventually. This gazebo is up, and we're thinking, this gazebo better not need to be taken down again. If we can just tie it somewhere, of course, Monday evening had to be taken down. So we came back on Tuesday morning thinking, right, how hard can it be? Four poles in a tent, and we've done it before. It took about 10 minutes this time to get this four poles in a tent, but we got there Wednesday morning with a problem. Mark Balance wasn't there. And uh, I don't know if he was sleeping in or what was happening, but he wasn't there, and uh, it was left to the rest of us, and we got, into, we got into a terrible state. We thought we had it up, 
And then somebody just had to come along and go, that's not straight there. Something, something's not right. And then we're panicking. Is it that pole? Is it that pole? What are we doing? And I was just thinking to myself, how hard can it be? We've done it before. We can do it again. And that was what was going through my mind. We've done it before. We can do it again. Sometimes as Christians, what we need to do is look back and see that Christ has done it before and Christ can do it for us again. Verse 30, what does Paul say that Christ has done? Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called, and whom he called, he also justified. Paul gives three pillars of who we are as Christians in Christ. We are predestined, controversial, we are called, and we are justified. So how does that help the here and now? You know, sometimes just to know that before the foundation of the world, God knew you, he loved you, he knew exactly everything about you before you were even a thought in anybody's mind, he knew you and he loved you. Does that not encourage you this morning? Does it not encourage you, secondly, to know that you've been called? At a stage in your life, if you're a believer... If you're a Christian, you saw for the first time who Jesus really was. You saw for the first time how much of a sinner you really were. And by the Holy Spirit, you were called effectively to faith in him. Does that not encourage you this morning? Thirdly, does it not encourage you to know this morning that you're justified? What does it mean to be justified? It means to be right in God's sight. It means that when God looks at you, you are declared righteous. Not because of anything that we have done, but all because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian for whatever reason, and there's many reasons that people will give, you haven't been called through to faith and you are not this morning justified. You're not righteous in God's sight, but instead you're condemned. Not just because of a list of sins that you have done, but it's more than that. It's because of who you are. You're a sinner. You are condemned before God. That's what the Bible says. But this morning you can know what it means to be called and to be justified, to be made right with God. So if you're a believer this morning and you are in the middle of something, you're going through a trial and that can look different to all of us. Look back. Look back at what Jesus has done and do what I did on that Wednesday morning as I looked at that gazebo. Look back and know if Jesus has done all these things before, he can work it together for good now. So that's the first one that Paul encourages us to do. Look back. Secondly, what does Paul encourage us to do? Somewhat obvious, he encourages us to look forward. Read the last bit of verse 30 with me. Them he justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Notice that Paul speaks about this glorification. He speaks about it in the past tense. He speaks about the predestination has happened. He speaks about the calling, it's happened. He speaks about the justification, it's happened. But he also speaks about the glorification as if it's already happened. Paul is so sure and he is so certain in his God that it's as if it has already happened. He's been predestined, he's been called, he's been justified and his faith is so sure that it's as if he's already been glorified. His confidence in his Lord is so great. So the question I ask when I come to this verse, well, what is this glorification? What is it that Paul is so certain about? Turn back with me to verse 22 of Romans 8. Paul is personifying creation. He's speaking about all of creation. And in verse 22, listen to what he says. He says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. He's speaking about creation under the curse of sin from when Adam and Eve sinned. And he speaks about the pain that that puts on creation. And he speaks about it together. We groaneth 
and travaileth together, verse 23, not only they, not only creation, those who have come before, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. This is the glorification, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. That's what Paul is speaking about. That's what he is looking forward to. He is looking forward to ultimate redemption for the people of God. And maybe this morning you find it really, really hard to look forward. Maybe you find it so, so hard because life is so difficult that you, can't, you find it so hard to look back, let alone look forward, because your head is completely focused in the suffering of now. Whenever I was on teaching practice, um, there's a few teachers in here this morning, Stram Millis. One of the parts you have to do is you have to go on a six-week teaching placement. And I was assigned to a little primary school in North Belfast. And every Friday afternoon, we'd undertake the really difficult task of taking all the P4s from the school up around the corner to the local leisure center for a swim. Now, the teacher, she knew what she was doing. She was white. She said, I'll go to the front of the line. You take up the back of the line. And I thought, how hard could it be? But there was this one wee boy, and his name was James. Do you know what it means when somebody's just sort of in their own wee world? That's the nicest way I'm going to put it. They just, they're not really in touch with everybody else. They're content to just sort of walk along and sing away, chirp away to themselves. And really, the, they don't really care about what else is going on around them. Well, we James, every, every day, he'd walk along on that Friday and he'd have his head down and he'd be singing away to himself and he'd sort of be walking along like this here. And I'd have to come along to him, put his hand on his shoulder and say, James, you need to look up or you're going to walk into something. Okay, Mr. Shields, okay. And the head would go down and he would keep going. And he would keep going. And I was thinking, sooner or later, he's going to walk into something. Sure enough, I don't know, it was one of the later weeks of the teaching placement. He's walking along and you just hear this thud. Top of the head, right into a lamppost. Starts crying his eyes out. And of course, as the teacher, you're not supposed to come along and say, well, I did tell you that was going to happen, didn't I? You need to come along and, James, are you okay? Are you okay? And do you need a tissue? You didn't have any tissue. And I said, James, do you know why that happened? And he said, sniffling. And he said, I wasn't looking where I was going. And I said, that's exactly what it is. You weren't looking in front of you. Could I encourage you, Christians, just take time sometimes just to look up and look ahead at what is to come. Look at the glorification that is to come for you. That redemption to God. Does that not amaze you? And you know, I know sometimes that all of that can get lost in the day-to-day -day of life, in the struggles of life. It can be the hardest thing to do to lift your head and to look forward at what is to come. That's what Paul is commanding us. He's encouraging us to do. Look forward to your glorification. It's going to happen. As sure as you have been justified, you will also be glorified. Does that not give us hope this morning to know that we can trust God to work all things together for good? Thirdly, and your favorite word to hear, finally. Thirdly and finally, what about now? You know, if all we are ever doing is looking back and looking forward, we become you know, those meerkats that you see before Coronation Street. All we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking back to what's happened. We're looking forward to what is to come. We're going to end up missing where we are right now. And you know, sometimes as Christians, we can become almost stuck. We can look back and we think it's great to be saved. It's great to be justified. We can look forward and think it's great to be glorified. Uh, it's going to happen. I can't wait. But what about now? What about the here and the now? What do we do in this little period in history that we have to live on this earth? What do we do? Verse 29, Paul gives us our answer. He says, for whom he did foreknow, that's God, God foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That is the purpose of the here and now. We are to be conformed to the image of his son. 
What does that mean in simple English? I like simple English. That means be like Jesus. That is the reason that God doesn't save us and then take us straight to glory. But we stay on this earth because we have a purpose, and that is to be like Jesus. And you know, sometimes we think, well, how is that trial, or how is that bereavement, or how is that grief, how is that ever going to help me be like Jesus? Surely that's a mistake. Surely he wasn't supposed to suffer like that, or surely this death wasn't supposed to come to my family. And maybe you're asking, how, how does this make me more like Jesus? Maybe just begin to think about it. You know, maybe you've suffered at the hands of someone else. Maybe someone else has hurt you, has let you down, and you're asking, how has this been worked together for good? Perhaps it was God who gave you the grace and the love to forgive. Perhaps it was God who gave you a peace in your heart to forgive that person, to make you more like Jesus right in the midst of a trial or a suffering. Or maybe it's a death in your family, maybe it's months, maybe it's years ago, and you're still asking the question, where was the good in it? Why did it happen? Maybe God gave you the grace and the peace and the humility to completely depend upon him and to become more like Christ by becoming more dependent upon the Father. That is why we're here. That is why we have this period. That is why we can trust that God will work all things together for good. Ultimately, the good is us becoming more like Jesus. That's what the ultimate good is, and that can look different in all of our circumstances. But I wonder this morning, as we look back to what God has done, as we look forward to what God will do, I wonder this morning, do we have the hope and the faith to rest in the fact that in the here and the now, God is working all things together for our good so that we would become more like Jesus and that he alone would be glorified. I wonder this morning, do you have that hope? Or I wonder are you here this morning and perhaps you don't have that hope? Perhaps you're not a Christian. Could I ask you to ask yourself the question, why am I actually here? Why am I actually on this earth? Is it chance? Is it because of a decision my parents made? Or could it be, could it be that you're on this earth to be called by God, to be justified by God, and then to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be molded, to be chiseled, so that you become more like him, so that you could bring glory to God. I wonder, could that be your purpose? That's what Paul says. That's what God says is your purpose. I wonder, do you understand that this morning? Maybe you have questions. Could I encourage you? Read it for yourself. Study the word. And this morning, as believers and non-believers alike, would we actually understand we have a purpose to be on this earth? We are on this earth to be like Jesus Christ. And that is what this world needs more than anything. It doesn't need people to judge it. It doesn't need people to go out and turn up our noses when we look at the sin around us. It needs people to be like Jesus. It needs people to be gracious and to love those all around us so that God alone would be glorified and that we could know he will, he will, he will work all things together for good. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we confess to you that so often we doubt you. Lord, we doubt why you do things. We doubt why you allow circumstances to come into our lives. But Father, we just pray that as we would look back to what you have done, as we would look forward to what you will do, would you just give us encouragement and give us hope to know that we can rest in you, that we can believe in you, and Lord, that we would see you are working all things together for our good, and Lord, would we become more and more like Jesus every single day that we are here, and we pray this in his name for his glory.